Hi, my name is Kevin Thomas, W1DED. It's Monday night. I'm here again with a contest crew. Missing one, Randy Thompson, K5ZD, couldn't join us. But I do have Chris, KL9A, Dan, N6MJ, and Scott, K0MD. Tonight, we thought we would tackle the subject of building a station. Chris has been building his new station at his ranch in Montana. And it's a subject that comes up in a lot of our conversations. Stations exist from the multi-multi at K1LZ up in Maine to simple stations that are using wires. And I thought that by focusing our conversation tonight on what Chris is doing, but also what Scott and Dan have done, and some ideas that might help you if you're building a station. So Chris, I think I'll have you kick it off since you're the guy who's uh, building the station up in Montana. Tell me the genesis of that whole process. I've been a guest stop for 25 years, and I was finally in a position where we were going to be in that place for a long time. And it was either we spend the money to continue guest hopping and traveling and, and doing that thing, or find a place locally that I could have a station and hopefully the boys can do some fun things outside and we can have a place to get away. So uh, obviously we chose the local option. And that's kind of how it started. So when you made the decision, you clearly could have picked any locale within a certain radius. Why did you choose the locale that you did? So I had a couple criteria. Uh, the first one was it had to be within a couple hours of home. Uh, I looked within four hours and for better or worse, Montana is a big state. So there's a lot of places way past four hours. So. I looked for probably two years, uh, right in the middle of COVID, which was terrible because prices were through the roof and people were buying land sight unseen. But my criteria were pretty simple. It had to be rural. I wanted to be on top of a hill slash mountain and I had to have wintertime access that was reasonable. Uh, I don't mind snowmobiling in or, or whatever. Uh, did not have to have power, but it needed to be quiet and it needed to be really good with the, uh, the terrain analysis using the HFTA. That was it, literally number one. It was for a single purpose. I don't want to live there. I don't want to be there long term, you know, more than a week or so, uh, simply for radio. That was kind of how I chose it. Well, let's get into the HFTA. Uh, that's a topic that's come up several times in my conversations here in Maine. Tell me more about that. The, the HF terrain analysis was written several years ago. Uh, I think by N6BV, and it's proven to be really valuable. Uh, I think pretty much every station nowadays uses it. It's not gospel, it's not 100%, but it can tell you what's better and what's worse. And if you're choosing a location that doesn't require your wife to be happy, you know, commute to work, stuff like that, um, it, it, it can really benefit you. Uh, the place I chose was the best one I looked at, so that was was nice. But uh, you can look at the angles on your antennas, see how tall your towers need to be. Uh, if a stack is better than a single antenna based off, you know, to Europe or to JA or the stateside or whatever, uh, you can really deep dive into the details, but it gives you an idea of where you should put your antennas so you're not just guessing, which uh, I've found to be quite accurate. Dan could probably attest to that too. Uh, it's it's really invaluable. I think it came with the antenna book, so it's it's a value. It, it whatever you paid for it, it was worth it. I want to get back to Montana in a second, Chris. But pulling the other two guys in the conversation, I don't think that uh, Dan, you, or Scott chose your location for ham radio specifically. But tell me a little bit about your your situations, Dan. You first. So I actually live with my with my dad, uh, W6TND. Uh, he bought this location in 1975. And, you know, he was a ham at the time, and he actually did buy this property with ham radio in mind. Um, it's, uh, we're in a city lot, we have half an acre here, and it happens to be on top of a hill, just somehow he managed to pull that off. And so, um, you know, he did that with the thought of mind that he was going to build a station here. And they're just, you know, kind of subtle drop offs to the key directions, uh, but it's enough that uh, it, it does seem to make a difference. And, you know, we have a, a I call it a small station. I, I think for most people, it'll be a large station. But for me here, you know, we have three towers in the backyard. We have a 72-footer with a three-element uh, 40 on top and a five-element 20 below it. And then uh, on the other main tower, it's a 50-foot tower with a five-element 15 and a five-element 10. And then we have some wires for 80. Um, and with that setup, uh, you know, we've done very well in contests over the years. Uh, he used to do major contesting back in the day. And we do multi-ops here from the house. 
And then, um, you know, more recently, uh, I've done, you know, some of the smaller contests from here and have had pretty good success. So, uh, you know, we definitely have this property with Ham Radio in mind for sure. So I presume when your dad bought that property, though, HF terrain analysis was not available. So he did this all by feel. Uh, his brother is actually somebody who's very well known. It's uh, Rick and 6 nd He's now passed, but uh, Rick also had a very large station at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, they were able to come up with uh, uh, what, what kind of antennas that they needed. I don't know. I don't think it's HFTA, but there was other, other tools back then in the 70s and even in the early 80s that were available that weren't quite as good as HFTA. But, uh, you know, that, that's always been kind of a top of mind um, when we were when he was putting up the antennas here. And Scott, what about you? You know, we bought this property, which is about five acres. Uh, in 2001, uh, absolutely no thought given to uh, contesting uh, at all. Uh, simply checked to see if I could put a single tower up because I had a 40-foot tower at the time in my other home in the city of Rochester. So we live a couple of miles outside the city limits, five acres. The nice thing is uh, I live up on a plat up on a hill, and so it's 180 to 250 feet down, four to five wavelengths off uh any of uh, any sort of off the high bands down uh, to the surrounding valley. So it's a really nice boost. You know, I have a 130 foot tower. And then if you had 180 to that uh, functionally for 40 and uh, 20 and 15 and 10, those antennas get a lot of height and it really pays off with propagation. Uh, so yeah, no, uh, no thought given to contesting uh, at all and just bought it because it suited our family and uh, the house is uh, perfect. So for somebody who is putting up a station, and let's say, uh, you know, there's, there's two options. They can either uh, buy a property specifically for AM radio or they're, they're, they're going to stay in their existing home. Would you guys recommend that the first step is an HFTA analysis? That's what I would do. I mean, it depends how open to your family is to living someplace that maybe isn't perfect for everything else, but a little bit better for AM radio. One thing that I would definitely recommend if someone's actually out there looking for property, and I know Chris will back me up on this, if you're looking for a piece of property for with ham radio in mind, the number one key thing is it has to be radio quiet. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, when uh, Tim and, and 6WIM bought his property in Arizona, like he would bring uh, a mobile radio with them to just to see what the ambient noise is in that location. I'm pretty sure Chris did the same thing in Montana because you don't want to you know buy this property and find out you got you know, all kinds of crazy line noise that you can't fix. Uh, that that's the first thing that's just a non-starter. You have to be able to hear guys if you really want to do something uh, um, well in, in contest. Yeah, every every property I looked at, and I looked at 13 or 14, I brought my mobile rig and a ham stick, and I stuck it outside my truck and turned the truck off, and I tuned all the bands um, at every point on the property that was reasonable. And if it failed that test, it didn't look at it anymore. So that's... Uh, Dan hit it. That's super important. You know, Kevin, I would take a little different approach. Um, I would say first, does the property suit you and your family? Are the neighbors nice? Are they reasonable? Do you have enough land to do what you want to do? But I think even before you do that, I think the very first thing anyone should do building a radio station is to decide what are the goals of the station? What do I hope to achieve? I mean, if you want to be a world-class contester or competitor like uh, Chris and Dan, uh, you're going to need uh, 10 to 20 acres. You're going to need uh, 50 to 100 thousand dollars in investment, uh, and you're going to need to put stacks up. If you want to make DXCC, well, you can do it on a half an acre city lot with a 60 foot tower. If you live on the east coast, you can do wires. If you live out west, it's going to be harder, you know, to get DXCC on 80 and 40 with wires. So I think goals, goal oriented, and I think you also have to have a realistic. Uh, discussion with yourself about how much do you want to spend? You know, how much am I willing to invest in this? Because ham radio stations can become a lot like uh, high-end boats. They can become very expensive and it can become a ton of work. And while time in chair, otherwise known as bottom in chair time, is important, bottom in the air time is equally as important to maintaining the antennas. So it's important not to overbuild what you have or what you want to do because you want to be able to operate and not be repairing things all the time. So there's nothing wrong with HFTA. In fact, uh, Dean Straw was uh, at the W0DXCC in Rochester and did an analysis for me at my property and introduced me to it. And that sort of guided my first height of my tower. But I, I ultimately decided I needed to go higher and uh, base that on HFTA. Noise is important, but unless you have 
bought plenty of land, you can have someone move in next door to you who starts to grow marijuana or any other pro product that requires grow lights. And suddenly that really quiet location is out the window. I mean, uh, you know, Rob Sherwood talks a lot about his antenna ranch of, I think, 10 acres. And he's got noise now from grow lights not too not too far away. So that's important, too. You know, look at the where you're moving. I'm sure Chris will never have that problem in rural Montana. And Dan probably doesn't have it in his neighborhood in California, but it is a real issue in some states. So I think you need to just sort of have enough space around where you are. If you're really going to put a ton of money into it, this is your dream station, your last station. You got to have, uh, you know, things. You know, one of my neighbors put in a solar panel array and thankfully it doesn't have any noise. So I have not noticed anything with that. And I have beverages that run not far from where his array is. I don't pick up anything. So those are some of the important tangibles to think about. No, I appreciate that. I think that you're absolutely right. You need to understand what the functionality needs to be, what the purpose is before you take that first step. And probably even need to think about where you want to evolve to, correct? If, you, if you're doing single op today, you might want to do multi-single someday that might change things, correct? Yeah. Or your goals might change. You might find you like contesting and suddenly you want to compete with Dan and Chris and Randy and put stacks up. And, uh, you know, don't ever think that the last antenna you put up will be your last antenna. I've never, that's never not been my case at least. So let's say that all those things are agreed upon and now you're looking at towers and antennas. What, what's the thought process, Chris, that you went through for Montana w at your level with your competitive contesting what were you looking to accomplish through towers and antennas? I guess let me backtrack just a little bit. Uh, another super important piece that I have the luxury of doing from the ground up with a raw piece of land is the grounding and that kind of thing. Uh, I cannot under overstate that enough. Um, you really have to go have a good ground system. I've seen that at so many stations. And if you're going to build a separate shack at your house or even in your house, you can certainly improve your grounding. Um, Ward's book on grounding and bonding is is literally the best out there. So super important to, to hit that. Um, as far as antennas go, my use case is a little bit different. Um, Scott mentions maintenance, and that's a huge deal. So I am very much, uh, I want to I want to minimize maintenance. I don't live at my station, so time is very important. Uh, I just got back today, and how do I minimize maintenance? I don't have any rotators. That's, that's my number one thing. Um, for two reasons. I don't want to climb a tower in January in Montana. Um, and I want diversity. So I learned this at NK7U. Uh, Dan has helped implement this at ND7K. Um, guys will have rotating antennas to point in different directions, which is fantastic. It's, it's a great formula. What I like is a fixed stack in each direction. And not only do you get more gain in that direction, it's cheaper, you have less upkeep, and you have more versatility. Uh, a good rotator will cost you a few thousand bucks. Uh, a couple antennas will cost you less than that with feed line. You're still money ahead. You're going to be louder. So with being on a hill where I am, HFTA says my highest tower only needs to be about 85 feet on the high bands and 40 meters. I don't get any kind of a gain over 100 feet. So I don't need a tower over 100 feet. Uh, that's perfect. Keeps the cost down. Keeps the wind loading down. Um, I don't need 50-foot boom Yankees. It'd be nice, but I don't need them. Uh, that also keeps maintenance down. So when I'm looking at antennas, I'm looking for versatility and low maintenance and high survivability in the wintertime. Uh, that's where the terrain has to work for you. And so far, it's it's really, really outshined my expectations. I think it's also important to note that Chris has already been operating from the ranch without these stacks. And uh, he's already put up some uh, really big scores uh, with small antennas. And I think we should also... Uh, touch on that just a little bit and like what kind of antennas you've used up to this date uh, because uh, you don't have to put up the big station to be competitive necessarily um, you can do it with smaller antennas as well and chris has already proved that pretty well yeah i was gonna bring up you know wpx phone next weekend is a great opportunity uh, wpx has the tribander single element category which is super cool you know it's geared for guys with a tribander and a dipole at home or a vertical or whatever uh, no beverages allowed uh, the rules are pretty clear on what you can and can't do, but a tribander and some wires, and that's its own category. It's an overlay, and you can really compete. Uh, last year, I did WPXCW. Uh, I won the U.S. for that category. Doesn't hurt that nobody was really on from the East Coast, but uh, it was still super cool. And that's a great way to compete without having stacks and stuff like that. Um, I don't have any towers up right now. 
Uh, I have a 40 foot push up mast with a spider beam on it. And I just got a 40 meter four square and an 80 meter vertical. Um, I had dipoles until they fell down, but uh, you, you don't, like Dan said, you don't have to be the biggest station to compete, but what really matters is versatility. If you've got room for a dipole to Europe, uh, maybe put a dipole up for JA. You're going to be louder in a JA with that one, and it won't take you very much more room, and it's very cost-effective. So versatility is more important, I would say, than having the biggest Yagi. You know, um, I live in a similar winter climate as Chris, so uh, one tip uh, Glenn Johnson gave me was to bring every feed line in from each antenna to my house which allows one to troubleshoot issues during the winter season. And for us, you know, uh, first of October through the first of May is really a non antenna working season. So it's the weather's unpredictable. It's probably too cold and maybe too wet or too windy to climb. So we have to cram all the climbing and building into sort of May through the end of September. Um, I really like the idea of, uh, of having fixed antennas. Uh, I didn't have the luxury of doing that. I really, have one tall tower. I don't have room for another one on my five acres. So I used uh, multi-element mono banders. Uh, and then I have a triplexer and uh, high powered and low powered bandpass filters for each frequency. So I can use uh, two antennas at once. So the same stack at once sometimes, uh, two different bands. And that's, that's one of the ways I got around building uh, a lot of stacks. It's also more cost effective. It's also more palatable to your neighbors. You know, I think Chris is in a unique situation. And so is Dan when he's operating at Tim's place that they don't really have neighbors who complain too much. I live in a reasonably affluent neighborhood and uh, my neighbors, uh, you know, uh, I can't push it too hard or they will, uh, you know, uh, uh, force me to scale back my plans. So I think I've pretty much maxed out what I can can do in my, my neighborhood. Uh, and uh, as regard also as, with regard to what my wife will think is tolerable for a, you know, a home station. This is not a, she says, we're not a government uh, broadcasting station. This is a home. So you've got to keep it all within limits. So one of the things that strikes me, listen to you guys, um, there, there are so many variables, obviously in the decision-making process, right? What you want out of a station, but then so many variables on what you could actually put up. How does a ham radio operator like myself, who's only been back in the hobby a couple of years, uh, somebody that doesn't have your collective experience. How does one sort through all that, especially when some of these advisors are happy to spend your money? <laughs> that, that's a good question. I would say, uh, like Scott said, figure out what your goals are. Talk to guys that have similar goals and see what's worked for them. But more importantly, you're just going to have to try a bunch of stuff, uh, which is the best part anyway. And you've already seen it with your POTA stuff. Uh, you know, you're always looking for that next antenna that'll get you a little bit louder. Um, I think the point earlier was, you know, plan on growing. I've never met a ham in my entire life that didn't try to upgrade something every year or every minute. And if you put in a mindset where you have room to grow, you're going to be money ahead. Um, but you know, everyone's willing to spend someone else's money. So you, you just have to be, you know, cautious, but excited to try new things and you know the used ham market's booming so maybe if you buy something that doesn't work you can sell it and not be totally underwater kevin i, I think it's really important to stress this too uh you can buy used antennas refurbish them for 50 cents or less on the dollar but you do not want to skimp on coax and on connectors uh there's no point in putting in a three or four thousand dollar antenna system and using cheap coax and losing half your signal in between the antenna and your radio so uh, you really need to use really high quality coaxial cables and really good connectors. And the weakest link in your station will always sink your station. So, you know, you just have to be prepared and you really should, should put a budget on a spreadsheet, figure out what you're willing to spend, and then put a second column over where you double that and you'll be shocked at how quickly things go, how quickly your plans just cost more than you even expect. And you can't, you know, there's no reason to do it all at one time, right? I mean, I think Dan and Chris would say this, you build your station incrementally. You don't do it in just one setting. It, it's a it's a lifetime hobby. So you've got uh, the next 20 years to build it. So take that time and do it. So Chris, if you would, would you run down through the list of antennas that you intend to put up? And I'm talking about the short term. With, over the next, um, 
year, let's say that. Okay, over the next year. It won't sound so overly ambitious and crazy if I just say the next year. Um, well, let, let me say this. I have 16 Yankees currently in my container. And as Scott said, used antennas are great. Uh, you can you can refurbish them. You can get them, you know, tweaked, you know, optimized the way you want with new software. Um, there could be some metal fatigue in there, so you have to be aware of that. But uh, that's a great way to save money. Uh, so let's say for this this summer, I'd like to get two towers up, um, hopefully, and I want to get my 40 meter stacked Moxons up, which I already have, and I'd like to get one high band antenna in each direction. Uh, fixed if I can. And those would be kind of temporary until I get the other towers in. But um, ideally, if 80 meter four square would go up, which is pretty easy other than the laying radials, which takes forever. So that's that's the realistic goal. We'll see what actually happens. And what about 160? What will you do there? So 160, uh, eventually I'm going to put up a K3LR array, uh, the switchable direction um, with the parasitics. Uh, I don't think I'll get anything big up this year. Uh, I want to put a room 25 vertical up first. And in the meantime, I'll probably just put up some wires and stuff off the towers. I had really good luck with the T-top vertical at 72 feet, which is not an amazing antenna. Uh, so anything that gets me on the air on 160 will be just fine. And what about beverages? Is that not part of year one? Beverages are up now. Um, I've got more receiving antennas than I have transmit antennas. I just counted today. Um, so one of my beverages, my Europe beverage, is going to have to move because it's going where the, the towers are now. Or it's, it's, it is where the towers are going to go. Uh, eventually, I'm going to put up an eight-circle receive array. Um, I have a piece of land. I have 20 acres, but there's a road going through it. I, I say the word road very loosely. Um, and right across the street, uh, there's a great place for an eight-circle array. Uh, so that's the, the plan for receive antennas in addition to beverages further out on the property. So let's move on inside. Chris, again, let's start with you since you're working on Montana. Um, are you taking gear that you already have or have you been buying new gear for this station? Uh, both. Uh, I've accumulated lots of stuff. Actually, a lot of the stuff I had was for Dan and I's WRTCs, you know, two way switches, you know, bandpass filter, stuff like that. Um, I did buy triplexers, as Scott said, that's a great investment if you have a tri-bander and you can get on all bands and you can do multiple radios. I, I can't stress that enough. It's a really great investment. Um, I've purchased plenty, <laughs> uh, but I have a lot of used stuff. I have been lucky to have friends with stations that downsized and purchased stuff from them, was given other things. Uh, a lot of stuff I homebrew. Um, you know, I'm definitely on a budget and I build whatever I can and that saved me lots of money at the expense of time, but that's the fun part anyway. And Dan, what's your station look like at home? So at home, uh, it's a pretty simple setup. Uh, we have a, a K4, and then we have a KPA 1500. And, uh, you know, my dad's active every single day, uh, and that's uh, that's what he uses, and it works uh, amazingly well uh, for a station like this. And then, um, of course, over at uh, ND7K, you know, that's a recent station as well. We started building that in 2019, 2020, somewhere in there. And a lot of the, the gear over there is also uh, sourced from friends. Like I've donated a bunch of stuff, including antennas, radios, amplifiers, uh, just, you know, donated to the station. And then uh, Tim is always really good about uh, looking out for good deals. You know, if he sees a good deal on an amplifier, he just goes ahead and buys it. Uh, if it's not a good deal, he just says no and waits until the good deal comes up. So uh, I think sourcing, um, not necessarily cheap stuff, but uh, you know, there's definitely ways to do it a little more inexpensively than buying uh, new gear. And even at a big station like uh, ND7K, we've also uh, done the same thing. Going back to Scott's point about understanding what the purpose is of the station, when Tim decided in 2019 to put up ND7K, what was his goal? That's actually a really good question because... Uh, that's kind of where I came into play with the ND7K. Uh, me and Tim were actually at uh, uh, Dayton in 2019, and uh, we were um, we were done with Dayton. We were waiting for our flight. Uh, we ended up going to a Hooters because uh, that's what we did. Um, so we're at Hooters, and he's got this napkin out, and we're just trying to like figure out like what what is the goal for the station? Because uh, what he really wanted to do is he wanted to emulate Marco n 5 zo station here in Southern California. And what Marco does is he's got a single tower, much like Scott. It's like a 90-foot tower. And he's um, 
with that single tower, he's able to be very competitive, especially domestically, but he struggles uh, in DX contests. And so Tim was happy with that. You know, growing up, he was always into uh, domestic contests. And so he's that was his goal. He, he wanted to do well in domestics and have fun in DX contests. And so that's where I came along. I'm like, Tim, are you sure that's really what you want to do? Because, you know, um, we talk about how it's easy to continue to, you know, grow the station. Um, sometimes that could be a problem. You know, I've had, uh, I've been involved in other stations where they started out as this, you know, single radio station, and then they evolve into like a multi-single, and then they move to multi-two. Uh, and it's harder to add those layers on. And with Tim's situation, we were able to, you know, start from scratch. And we decided that we actually wanted to be competitive in DX contests as well. And from the West Coast, um, you can't do that with a single tower station. It's just not, uh, it's just not going to happen. And so that's when we came up with the plan uh, to do the three towers. Uh, so we, we went with uh, 330 foot towers instead of the 190 footer. And a lot like Chris, uh, we, we certainly have rotators at any 7K, but a lot of the antennas are fixed. And that is also to bring down the cost and also to help with maintenance. And, um, you know, the, the goal ended up being we wanted to be a multi-op station uh, and we wanted to be able to compete in domestic contests as well as compete in DX contests. And that's kind of how it all evolved. And Scott, in, in your case, obviously, you're, you're single op. You're, you're not looking to to do multi-single, multi-two at, at your station. No, I've done multi-single and multi-two at my station. I currently am not. I stopped uh, before the pandemic and uh, we've had... Uh, children in graduate school or law school living at home intermittently since. I just haven't brought strangers back into the house uh, to do that. And uh, I started doing SO2R contesting. So uh, uh, I've been working on doing that and, and instead of hosting, uh, you know, multi-op events at my place. But it is uh, set up to do multi-two or multi-single, high power either way. Uh, but really, it's uh, my station was designed to be competitive in DX and domestic contest and to also help me achieve... Uh, you know, multi-band DXCC, and I'm only five QSOs away from my ninth, achieving nine-band DXCC, lacking just five stations or five new ones on 30 meters, which I'll get this year, I hope. Um, and so I've achieved that goal. So I'm trying to re-figure out, you know, re reconfigure goals uh, uh, about what I want to do. Uh, if, I, if I were doing my station all over again, uh, I would probably move my tower another 20 feet or 30 feet uh, east of where it is, maybe, and raise it to 150 or 160 feet and uh, have uh, to give myself a little better signal on 40 meters. Uh, and uh, if I could do it all over again, I'd put two ring rotors on both 40 meter Yagis because I have two two element Yagis. And that way they could be in the same direction or in different directions and then turn the tower for the uh, 10 through 20 antennas. Uh, if you're doing like me and trying to have a contest and DX station, it gets sometimes tricky because you have antennas for 12 and 17 meters, which interact with your 20 meter Yagis. So you have to space those in a proper way. And you also have a 30 meter uh, Yagi on the tower. So I have a specially built antenna by Tom Schiller at 6BT. Did a, there's two elements on 40 and two on 30. JK and OptiBeam both sell a commercial version of what I have. Uh, and so I've tried to make good use of that. They're separately fed. So they, uh, they each have separate coaxes for each of those those antennas, each of those uh, bands, rather. So, yeah, that's uh, – but I think, you know, you, the other issue is um, you have to you, you have to optimize the spacing on your – if you have stacks, I used HFTA to optimize spacing, but where your guy wires or guy – I use Philly Strand for guys. Where they fall will determine uh, where you can space your Yagis. So everything is a little bit of a compromise. I think if you do like Tim di has done or, or Chris will do in Montana where you have separate towers, you can get by uh, with optimal spacing and guy where you need to. But with a single tower, you're really having to guy per their own catalog. Otherwise, you don't get a local zoning approval of your project. And so to some extent, that also determined where I could stack things. And I needed to have 40 meter and 20 meter antennas that would not interact. And so or 15 meter and 40 meter antennas that wouldn't interact. So I have uh, coil loaded or uh, linear loaded 40 meter antennas to avoid interaction. And so that's another compromise. You know, I think uh, Dan said last last week that uh, the OWA full size 40 outperforms the compromise 40, which is four coil loaded. You know, and four four element coil loaded. And you know, I think uh, if you live in a place like mine, 
you're going to have to accept compromise. You know, you're just going to be one half or one S unit weaker than somebody running a full sized antenna for 40. And, and I think that's a reality of, of uh, the hobby. So in the decision making process, where does remote come into play? Did Tim at ND7K consider setting up remote? I, I should know the answer to that, but I don't. Uh, Chris, are you planning on operating your Montana station remote? Well, I'd like to eventually. Uh, the big kicker there is I don't have power. So that's a little bit tricky. Um, I, I, I will put up a receiver, uh, hopefully this fall. Uh, I do have a solar panel and a battery. I'd like to listen to my stuff. That'd be cool. Um, but remote, remote's on the list for me, but uh, I'd say it's not a priority. Um, Dan can talk about ND7K, it's remote access. So with ND7K, um, if the station's fully remotable, um, but we actually prefer to do all contests on site. Um, that's just a personal philosophy between myself and with Tim as well. Um, even during the COVID times, uh, you know, we, we were probably the only multi-op still actually operating on site. Um, was that the smartest thing? Maybe not, but, uh, you know, that's what we ended up doing. So even during COVID, we had, you know, four, four guy multi singles, uh, going on and we just prefer the camaraderie thing. We brought that up before in other conversations. And so, uh, that's something that's, uh, that really means a lot to both of us. And so that's why um, having um, the, the guys on site is just so much more. You, you get that interaction with the with the people. It's just it's just a lot better uh, overall. And we have luckily, you know, we still have a lot of interest in the station. And so trying to find operators, uh, it's not super easy, but we can usually find guys that want to come out and join us. And uh, so that's the reason why that we've uh, kept all the contesting. Um, you know, uh, local and on site. And then uh, the, the other station that I'm uh, very invested in is ZF1A. And that station is also fully remotable. Um, and we actually have done some remote contests from there. And that's been, um, it's kind of funny with that station because uh, again, coming into the COVID times, um, we did not do any remoting until then. And actually Marty, uh, NN1C and Bill, W9KKN had the idea to remote the station and they came to me because I was one of, you know, I'm still one of the, the major players there. And I actually told them, no, I don't want to do it because I don't like, I don't like the idea of remoting. Um, and so they did not take my advice and I'm glad that happened because they did do the full remote. And that thing has been super valuable over the years. Now during COVID, we did do lots of uh, remote contesting. Um, I think even my, uh, I own the AWRL CW DX contest uh, overall top score. That was done remote from my this bedroom I'm sitting in right now, remoted into ZF for that contest. Uh, and then uh, it's also very valuable leading up to contests because one of the things that I like to do before contests is uh, check the bands. Well, I can't do that uh, when the station is in another country, right? And so uh, before the contest starts, um, you know, the, the month leading up to it, I'm on almost every single day at one point or another, just testing things via the remote and then, you know, we do the contest on site. So... Um, I think there's a lot of value in remoting for sure. Uh, and it just kind of depends on, you know, what it is that you uh, want to get out of it. So let's say that somebody has a longer term plan to remote their station. Are, are the things that they need to think about today in year one, say Chris, for example, like if you, if you want to remote your station, are the things that you're putting in place now to make sure that, that process is going to go a little bit more smoothly? Yes. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of off the shelf antenna switching and controllers and all kinds of cool stuff. And a lot of it's remote, directly remotable, which is super cool. Most remote stations have a separate PC at the site. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think that's kind of the majority. And I use the MOAS controller, which is fully controllable from a PC. So in the future, I can log right into that and control all my antenna switching and everything just like I'm there. Uh, I could have a touchscreen at home. I literally just mimic that anywhere in the world. And yeah, that was a conscious decision to make that a remotable thing in addition to all the other cool stuff it does. So why MOAS? Uh, <laughs> because overly complex projects are something that I needed. <laughs> um, no, the, the MOAS is, is the coolest thing that I've seen since the waterfall band map on a radio. Um, ND7K, ZF1A, definitely... Um, kind of quietly led the 
in, innovation, I guess, with that. Uh, it's been around a while, but W9KKN and NN1C really took it to the next level. And I didn't really realize how much until I operated at ND7K. And then really when I started seeing this, uh, the ZF1A files that they sent me, um, it's no wonder Dan set records with all these guys behind him. Uh, it was, it's very impressive and way above my skill set, but luckily they can help me with it. But uh, the, the MOAS is cool. It's not a turnkey project at all. I'm not even sure you can buy them anymore, but uh, it'll do everything you need and way more. I thought to get off on a tangent, but if somebody wanted a MOAS system, where would they start? Call Marty? Uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure they're not in production anymore. Uh, rumor has it someone's going to start making them eventually, but honestly, the support on it is limited and, uh, I, I'm not sure I should, I should say too much because someone's going to get flooded with orders and it's probably not going to be a good thing. Well, I love that you just said that the three of you had this great advantage because you have MOAS, but no one else can have one now. Well, no, you can, it's just, you can't buy them. Uh, I actually bought, uh, I got some boards and the, the build list is online. And I bought the boards and then populated them myself. So uh, it, it's, it's, there's a way. It's just not, you can't just go to DX Engineering and buy one. Though. But you can buy other automatic switches. Uh, the MOAS switch is designed by, I think, Marty, unless I'm mistaken about that, the Yankee Clipper Contest Club. And unless you have Marty as a technical advisor, I'm not sure that uh, it's easy to figure out. But I bought stuff from Array Solutions called Hamation Switches. They're not that easy to figure out. In fact, mine... Were automated for a while and then something changed and jay at array solutions was not ever not ever able to help me troubleshoot it and uh, uh the guy who makes them out i forget where he's at i think he's in he's in w7 land just hasn't been able to provide the support i need to make it automatic so i have manual switches to select the two antennas as a two by eight switch uh, and then dx engineering sells automated switches from a brazilian manufacturer at least that one and so there are lots of choices you can get i would say buy from a place, a retail place that can give you support to help you put it in unless you are a ACE computer programmer. Because if you're a, an appliance operator or an antenna builder, but not a software engineer, some of these are challenging. Scott said there's lots of options. And that, I'm just going to relay a story that I had from ZF1A. Um, it was uh, 2016. I just did the contest. And I actually came up with a wish list of things that I wanted to have happen uh, for the following year. And I put it on Facebook. And I just so happened to be friends with uh, RA6LBS, who is uh, also provides the LBS gear. I think that's also available somewhere stateside, DX Engineering or somewhere that uh, was selling that. Uh, but he reached out to me and said, hey, um, I, I can look at your list. And what was on my list was I wanted a, a triplexer. Uh, and I wanted um, to be able to uh, stack antennas so I can go in, in multiple directions. Because at that point, we can only go... Uh, one direction. There was no stacks. There was no uh, anything like that as out of 1A. And so he reached out to me and he was able to custom make everything that I needed for the station down there. And so the following year, you know, I went down there and I was able to implement it all. Um, so I had triplexers and also had quadplexers because um, I had some of the antennas also had 40 meters. And then I had uh, stack matches through from 10 through 40. So I can use my tribanders on multiple bands at the same time. Um, so there's definitely lots of options out there outside of MOAS. But of course, you know, the, I'm lucky to have, you know, the Marty connection. I think actually the, the main driver behind MOAS is uh, Paul K1XM. Um, he's like the, the main guy behind it. But then, uh, like, like Chris was saying, you know, Marty and Bill have just taken it to the next level. So I'm very fortunate there. But, you know, I, I was able to put some really good scores with the LBS gear and then all the other stuff out there. It's, you know, it's, it's also pretty good stuff too. I would just add that it's, it's uh, DX Engineering has not been able to stock LBS gear since the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you can buy from LBS. You can buy directly into Russia. I don't know how they process it since they don't have access to uh, Western banking, SWIFT codes and things. But they will process orders and they will ship to you. But it's but a hefty fee for that. So uh, and be prepared to shell out a lot of money and you may have to go through a third country to get them shipped to you. The off-the-shelf stuff is great. It's going to limit you in some functionality compared to something you can start and do whatever you want with. That's not the worst thing in the world because when it's overly complex, it doesn't work. Uh, if it fails during a contest, it does you no good. Uh, but one note, you know, is that F1A put all this cool technology in kind of leading edge stuff. 
And that, Dan, was that 2017? Is that what you said? So the, the LBS stuff went in in 2017, and then uh, Marty and Bill weren't involved until 2019. So they, that's when we started moving beyond the LBS stuff to like the MOAS kind of stuff was after that time. So did you win the contest in starting in 2017 or how did that work out? Um, let me, let me think. Um, no, I uh, didn't win that one, but correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think, I don't think you won either. Did you? <laughs> oh, I just met between <laughs> us. That's all I care about. That's all I care about. I had, I had to look at my wall real quick to see, uh, I just had to refresh my memory. So anyway, continue. So, so who won that contest? I'm not. I'm not hearing you guys, Chris or Dan. Who, which one of you won it? I, I don't know who won the contest. Probably Jose at D4. Probably but uh, yeah, in 2017, I did beat Dan from TI7. So just uh, all that tech, and you really can't outdo propagation. That's for sure. Oh yeah, that, that's that's a given, 100 for sure. I want to go back to an earlier point and see if I can get a straight answer. Other than the three of you who clearly know what you're doing and building a station, who are some of the people nationally that a new ham could reach out to for quote unquote expert advice on a station rather than taking, you know, kind of flipping the coin and getting bad advice from their local HRO or um, local club member? You know, Craig Thompson talked about visiting K3LR and I guess W3LPL and some other stations before he put a ton of money into his station. So I'm not suggesting you go visit K3LR because unless you're going to build a top end 0.1% uh, performance wise station, visit four or five hams within a 500 mile radius who have something like you're interested in and just see what they did and talk to them and then come to contest university. Frank Donovan gives out more pearls per hour than anyone and Ward Silver as well. And I think if you have questions, man, I would write Frank or Ward or Dan or Chris and ask them uh, about what to do. And Tim, N6WIN has a lot of uh, insight into doing this. And uh, I mean, if he's open to people contacting him, I don't know. Uh, you can maybe comment on that, Dan. Yeah, I mean, it never hurts to ask. Uh, and we've had plenty of people ask a lot of questions. And, you know, we try our best to uh, lead them to the right answers. And I think one thing that you really touched on that, strikes a chord, Scott, is the, you know, going to contest university or watching it online. And then uh, if you can actually go to Dayton and be around those guys, that would be a perfect opportunity to pull somebody like K9CT aside and say, hey, I got this question. Can you give me an answer? I'm sure um, he'd be more than happy to do it. And then uh, for those of us on the West Coast, you know, there's going to be some guys that are showing up at Visalia and, uh, you know, you might have an opportunity to ask questions there as well. So I think that's a great point, Scott, for sure, is the Go to those places if you're super interested in this hobby and you'll have that opportunity. You know, Scott's right. You know, you're not going to try to put up a K3LR or a W3LPL or whatever, but you can take tidbits out of it that will carry over to your station, no matter how small it is. Uh, one thing that we talked about when I was at K3LR last was uh, he's got RG400 in his shack. And there was a couple of new guys there. and um, It was kind of, okay, why are you using RG400? It's like, well, it's double shielded. You know this this and this that's that's what we want to reduce interference and uh tim simply said if it wasn't the best i wouldn't have used it and that that really made a lot of sense and that's something that i've carried over at my place um that specifically and i learned that from uh, nd7k um little stuff like that will add up quickly even if you're just 100 watts and some some wires uh, maybe it reduces your interstation interference or your uh, RFI with your TV or your computer or stuff like that. Uh, so you don't have to put up 200 foot towers, but any little tidbits you can take from other stations is going to be useful. Chris, I know you came to the party with some notes. Do you have anything left on your note list that we should talk about? Uh, I've, been, I've been referencing them here. Uh, not really. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of in-person operating, as we've talked about lots of times, like Dan said. Uh, and one thing that maybe Arizona has over Montana is people don't want to come to Montana during contest season. The, wa the weather's terrible. Uh, people go to Arizona during contest season. So it, it, scalability is, is not just dependent on land and, and you know, resources, but if anyone's going to not go, why have it? You know, you put up a multi-multi station in, you know, Svalbard Island. Yeah, some guys might show up, but realistically, that's going to be tough. So I, I would keep that in mind. If you want to have multi-ops, that's awesome. But be realistic about it if you can actually get people to go and uh, figure out where you're going to accommodate them. 
um, the accommodations are low on my list. And we're going to run into that next weekend where I don't have a lot of creature comforts uh, <laughs> or any creature comforts. So uh, keep keep that in mind. If you're going to house people, make sure you have a bedroom or you, you know you have a place for them. Make sure everyone's okay with whatever creature comforts are there or not, because that can make or break a good experience, especially for a new ham. Good advice. So am I taking it that um, during contest season, people go in in snowmobiles? Uh, well, it's been done. Uh, last year here, I made it every every time I went. I made it, but there was a couple times where it was really iffy. Uh, this year, there's like no snow, so it's no big deal. But um, I have been to some contest stations in Alaska that were definitely park at the bottom of the driveway or bottom of the hill, and you're walking for a mile or the guy at the top pick you up on a snowmobile. Kevin, I think there are some more things we should talk about that are not so obvious until you think about them. Uh, number one, uh, make sure the lighting in your ham shack is good. It's not too bright because you don't want that at night, uh, but it needs to be sufficient so you can see. Uh, secondly, uh, you want to have good heating and air conditioning or uh, HVAC control. If you're running tube type amplifiers, uh, and I have one of those, and I also have a solid state amp, they get pretty warm. And uh, many times during a contest, I'm having to take off shirts or take off clothing layers because I'm just so hot. My, my ham shack does not have really good HVAC. Uh, and I bought a fan this year to try to pull some of that hot air out or blow some cooler air in. So I'm going to experiment with that. I think third... Um, most important thing in a contest is to have your monitor in front of you, your keyboard right in front of you, perhaps your paddles close by, but everything else doesn't have to be right in front of you. You know, the radio can be to the side. Uh, the amplifier, if it's an automatic amplifier, you don't need it close by. The antenna switches don't need to be so close. Um, and you want to make sure that if you're going to have a manual antenna switch, it's far enough away that you have to stop transmitting before you flip an antenna. Otherwise, you'll hot switch and break your switch. Um, and I think if you look at my QRZ page, you'll see how I have things set up. Uh, and I, you'll see on my QRZ page that I have two wall-mounted 27 or 28-inch computer screens. But I'm not using either one of them. And I've gone to a desk-mounted uh, 27 or 26-inch monitor. And I did that because I was getting neck strain because the others were just too high and you were looking up. And you need to look sort of at the monitor or down at the monitor. And so ergonomics of how you sit and the chair that you use is also really important. Now, the chair in my QRZ photo was taken for uh, a magazine that I was featured in, not a ham radio magazine. And so I don't use that. I have a gaming chair that I use that's comfortable, that's got pat for the, cushioning for the arms and the elbow. And um, it just needs to be comfortable because you need to be able to sit in that chair for several hours to be competitive or do well. So it's really important uh, to not fail to put adequate thought into uh, the desk, the, the chair, the monitor, uh, and how easily things are to reach that you need to adjust. And anything that you can get into trouble with by flipping it at the wrong time, put it far enough away that you have to stop transmitting so you can, do, you can, you can, you can change the band or change a manual amplifier switch or something. So you don't just in the middle of the night when you're exhausted, uh, make a huge mistake that's going to disable part of your station or lead to a thousand or two thousand dollar repair. So those are some other things that uh, that I recommend. And um, if I could keep a small refrigerator in my ham shack, I would. So I wouldn't have to, to get out of it to get something to eat or something to drink. But, uh, you know, and then, uh, it, again, it just needs to be comfortable. Good lighting, not, o not overwhelming lighting. And uh, just, you know, I think good headphones as well. So I don't know, Dan, Chris, what do you think about those things? I think uh, ergonomics are super important. But man, what works for me does not work for other guys and vice versa. Uh, I've gone to lots of ham shacks where guys have said, oh, this is super great and this and this and this. And I sit down, I'm like, oh my God, this is awful. Uh, I hate it. Um, so one thing that I'm big on, I'm, I'm, I'm not a short guy, neither is Dan. Uh, desk height is very important. Um, the uh, kind of de facto height of 30 inches has been very successful um, in relieving, you know, hunched over, you know, not being able to be up well enough. Um, chairs, I don't like chairs that aren't mesh. Uh, mesh chairs are nice so I can breathe. I don't sit down and get sweaty the whole time. Uh, but the chairs that I really like, I know Dan hates them. So, um, you know, it's it's very, very specific to each person. Scott hit it right on the head, you know, and uh, one of the nice things at ND7K is we do have, we actually have a full-size fridge in there in the shack and a small fridge too. So, uh, anything you want is right behind you. Um, 
uh, that's obviously not something that everyone has the opportunity to do, but uh, if you have the space and, and the time to do that, that works out well. And then like the, the heating and the air conditioning is a huge thing. Like I, at Indy 7K, the first uh, couple contests that I did were uh, NAQP in January. And you think Arizona is like this warm place, right? Well, Tim's kind of up in the foothills. It was down into like the 20s and there was absolutely no heating at all in the shack. And I'm doing a low power contest. There's no amps going or anything. And I was like freezing in that shack. Like I'm sitting there like I'm jittered, like I'm, I'm shaking because I was so cold. Uh, and then, uh, you know, luckily the I did the contest the following weekend and uh, had some nice gloves and, you know, I was all ready to go, you know, for, for that one. But uh, I think it is important to have that uh, handy for sure. Well, gentlemen, thanks for taking time tonight to talk about building a station. Clearly, this is, uh, there's a lot of variables, a lot of things to think about, but I think you're going to give people a lot to consider as they're either building a station from scratch or evolving the station they're in now. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Kevin.